Module 8 will discuss the stresses found in rigid pavement. There are many factors that can lead to concrete pavement deterioration, and they include heavy truck loads, stresses induced by temperature changes that can make the slab curl and warp with warmer and cooler temperatures, free water retaining pavement structure, loss of subgrade support due to pumping, inadequate maintenance. So in order to design and rehabilitate the rigid pavement, we must have a good understanding of the causes for the distresses and how to identify them. First, let's look at some good reference materials. Here, we are introducing you to FDOT Rigid Payment Condition Survey Handbook. This is a guide developed to provide the procedures for conducting visual, mechanical, and automated payment condition evaluation of the department's rigid payment system. The data collected is uploaded to the payment condition survey, and the website is provided here per district or per county to prioritize projects based on their ratings for ride and cracking parameters. Another helpful reference material is FHWA Distress Identification Manual for the Long-Term Payment Performance Program. This is the fifth revised edition. We have provided links to all these manuals in this slide. The Payment Condition Survey Manual includes information on the following signs of distress. Faulting, pumping, cracking, shutter slabs, transverse cracking, longitudinal cracking, and corner cracking, joint distresses, poor joint condition and spalling, surface defects such as surface deterioration and patching, shoulder deterioration, and ride quality. The pumping of concrete is a process where the action of a heavy wheel load across the transfer joint will cause the expulsion of water in fine base materials and suspension underneath the pavement slab to escape through the pavement joint at the edge of the pavement. The pictures shown here are examples of distress due to pumping and that's what it would look out in the field. Common reasons are water infiltration, erodible base material, poor joint sealer allows water to infiltrate, and heavy wheel load causing erosion. The mechanism of pumping is captured well in the following sequence. Water enters the base from joint and cracks in the pavement, as you can see on figure A. As the wheel load approaches the pavement joint on the approach slab, the water underneath the pavement moves slowly to the next slab. And that's why you can see on figure B. Some eroded fine material also moves in this direction. Then when the wheel load crosses the joint on the approach slab, the water underneath the pavement moves rapidly back to the adjacent slab. This high speed water causes more erosion of the pavement base. Some water is ejected up uh, through the joint with some of the base material. Evidence of the base material can be seen as stains on the shoulder, as you can see on figure six. And the final result is void under the leave slab and possible buildup material under the approach slab. So the void creates a cantilever effect on the concrete pavement. This results in cracking and faulting of the slab, and that's on figure D. The severity of pumping is measured in terms of light, moderate, and severe, as you can see on this table. Uh, light is when visible deposits of material, light stains, shoulder sediment at the transfer joint, it, it may include one or all of these. Moderate is when visible deposits of material, moderate stains, shoulder sediment at the transfer joint, moderate faulting at the shoulders, they can range from an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch, and it may include one or all of these. Severe is when visible deposits of materials, heavy stains, shoulder sediment at the transfer joint, moderate to severe faulting at the shoulder, anything greater than a quarter of an inch, it may include one or all of these. 
Other items contributing to pumping are poor load transfer or low stiffness of the subbase. In new pavement, the elevations of each slab at the transverse and longitudinal joints are the same. For pavement that have faulting, there is an elevation difference between the slabs at the joints. Faulting can be caused by the erosion on this leaf slab and buildup on the approach slab of base fines by the action of pumping. A lack of load transfer also contributes to faulting. The severity of the distress for faulting is measured in increments of 30 seconds of an inch. The larger the fault measurement, the more severe. Faulting data is collected using a laser profiler during the collection of the ride rating data. Fault measurements are utilized to compute a fault index, FI, which represents the average faulting for the rated section in 30 seconds of an inch. Fault in index is calculated by multiplying the fault measurement by 32. That equals 0.25 times 32, and that equals 8. That's 8, the fault index, for a quarter of an inch fault. Some of the information is summarized in the table and comes from Standard Plans Index 353-001, sheet 2 of 2. Cracking occurs when concrete slab breaks into two or more pieces. The general causes for cracking is generally contributed to by shrinkage, loss of slab support due to voids, sediment of embankment, or misaligned dowels. The types of crackings are intercenti cracks or shatter slabs. It's when the slab is broken into three or more cells. Causes are continuing deterioration of one or more or a combination of transverse, longitudinal, and corner cracks. Transverse cracking occurs at right angles to the center line. The causes are improper joint spacing, installation depth or dimensions, improper alignment of flow transfer assemblies, thermal gradient warping and movement stresses, stiff unbonded subbase, shrinkage due to rapid moisture loss during construction, heavy truck loading, and a combination on any of these. This is a graphic on how to measure transverse cracking and determine the width of the spalls per FHWA Distress Identification Manual. Make sure to record the number and length of each transverse crack and identify a severity level. Measure the width of that spall um, as you can see on detail A, B, um, and also on detail C, D. Uh, use standard plans index 353-001 to determine the severity of the cracks. Take good notes on the assessment of each distress and the level of severity to determine the correct repair method also using the guidelines per the standard plans. A summary of the crack severity is shown on slide 15 and a more detailed information on repair methods will be covered under module 9 for concrete rehabilitation. Longitudinal cracking. Some of the causes are sewing the joints too late. Standard Specs 350-13.3.3 provides guidance to saw cut the pavement as soon as possible, but in no case no longer than 12 hours after placing the concrete. Also, insufficient cut depth. Um, they need to follow guidelines provided in Standard Plans Index 350 and also Specs 350-13. Loss of subgrade support, thermal gradient warping and movement stresses, heavy truck loading, and it could be one or all of the above. Corner cracking. Some of the causes are the loss of subgrade support due to pumping, stiff unbonded subbase, warping, tie bars placed too close to a transfer joint, heavy truck loads, and a combination of all the above. The top graphic shows how to measure longitudinal cracking and width of spalls 
The bottom graphic shows corner cracking. Uh, this is per FHWA Distress Identification Manual. And as you can see on the top graphic, longitudinal cracking are cracks predominantly parallel to the pavement center line, determining the spalling as shown on detail A, B, and also shown on uh, detail C, D. Make note if you have faulting or differential and elevation in between the two sides of the slab where the longitudinal cracking occurred. The bottom graphic shows how to measure corner cracking. As you can see, a corner of the slab is separated by a crack that intersects the adjacent longitudinal and transfer joint, describing approximately a 45 degree angle with the direction of traffic. As mentioned before, the level of severity can be determined using Standard Plans Index 353-001, page 202. The crack severity is shown in this table. For transfers, longitudinal and corner cracking is measured in terms of light, moderate, and severe. Light is visible cracks less than an eighth of an inch wide. Moderate is cracks equals from an eighth of an inch to half an inch wide and little faulting or intrusion of debris. Severe are cracks greater than half an inch wide and or loss of aggregate and or lock, intrusion of water and debris, faulting and or spalling. For intersecting cracks is either moderate or severe. Moderate is slabs broken into several pieces with some interlock remaining. Replacement is necessary and severe is slabs broken into pieces that are acting independently and replacement is necessary. Severity of cracking is of great concern because it's measured of the degree of distress and it is used to assist in directing the rehabilitation strategy to either do a slab replacement versus doing a clean and seal random crack. Joint distress is when poor joint condition and or spalling occurs. That poor joint condition is a loss or deterioration of joint seals. Some of the causes are cracking, which are the most common, splitting and erosion sealant, hardening of the sealant due to age and oxidation, loss of face bond of the sealant material to the reservoir, improper cleaning of the reservoir prior to insulation, moisture condition prior to insulation, and joint dimensions of reservoir and sealant. Spalling is also a joint distress. It's caused by cracking and disintegration of the slab edges, caused by intrusion of incompressible material, which restricts the slab expansion and contraction. Those incompressible materials are usually rock and sand, caused also by a regular shape of the crack and poor load transfer. The top graphic illustrates the proper measurement of crack width and width of spalls for cracks and joints. The bottom left illustrates spalling of longitudinal joints and how to record the width of the spall. The bottom right illustrates spalling of transfer joints and how the width of the spall needs to be measured. More information on the level of severity shows how to measure a spall crack, spall joint, and determine the width of spalls can be found in Standard Plans Index 353-001, page 2 of 2. That will provide guidance on the level of severity to determine the repair method. If you would like to learn more on distress identification, I encourage you to review the FHWA Distress Identification Manual on the link uh, to download the manual was provided on slide three. FHWA also has a class that covers all aspects of distress uh, manual, and you can learn more by visiting their website. This table summarizes the severity of joint distress. The severity for poor joint condition is measured in terms of partially sealed or not sealed. 
uh, where partially sealed, it's a joint seal that has deteriorated to the extent that adhesion or cohesion has failed and water is infiltrating into the joint. Not sealed, this joint seal is either non-existent or has deteriorated to the extent that both water and incompressible material are infiltrating the joint. The severity of spalling is measured in terms of light, moderate, and severe. Light can be spalled area less than 1.5 inches wide. Moderate is spalled area that is 1.5 to 3 inches wide. And severe is any spalled area greater than 3 inches wide. Surface defect is when surface deterioration and or patching occurs. So let's see surface deterioration is the disintegration and loss of the concrete wearing surface. Some of the causes are poor construction materials such as poor aggregate, cement, additives, mixing operations, etc. Poor construction methods such as poor placement, curing, finishing, cutting. Traffic such as tire, rims, chains, and metals. And chemical reactants. For patching, these are corrections made to pavement defects, causes maintenance forces correct or improve a section of pavement that has deteriorated and may provide a solution that can perform as well as the existing material. The performance of the patchy material depends on the correct application in materials, either concrete, asphalt, or other, the workmanship, preparation, finishing, curing, and the traffic conditions. This table summarizes the severity of surface defects. The severity of surface deterioration is measured in terms of moderate or severe. Moderate is some coarse aggregate that has been exposed and the wearing surface has disintegrated up to a depth of half an inch. Severe, it's most, most coarse aggregate that has been exposed and some has been removed. Wearing surface has disintegrated to a depth of a half an inch or greater. The severity of patching is measured in terms of fair and poor. Fair being the patch is providing marginal performance and is expected to serve its function for a few years. Poor is the patch has deteriorated to the extent that it no longer serves its function and should be replaced as soon as possible. Shoulder distress is one, one or all the following occurs. For concrete shoulders, you can have pumping of water under the shoulder, faulting due to loss of slab support, cracking due to off-tracking of heavy trucks, joint distress, and surface effects. For asphalt shoulders, you can have irregular movement of shoulder material due to pumping of water under the shoulder, a drop-off uh, in the elevation between the roadway and the shoulder due to off-tracking of heavy trucks, and time, environmental deterioration. For grass shoulder, erosion of the shoulder material due to pumping and runoff and off-tracking of heavy trucks. The severity is not measured in the field but noted in the survey. Poor ride quality is caused by changes in the longitudinal profile of the road. Some of the causes are faulting, cracking, surface effects, repair work such as patching, slab replacement and spall repairs. Lack of control on the original construction may include one of these or all of these. Ride quality is reported on a scale from 1 to 10, with 10 being the best. Ride profilers are used by the State Materials Office to measure the ride quality. As you can see the picture of the vehicle on this slide and the International Roughness Index, the IRI, are the values are zero for worse and 10 for the best. This concludes Module 8, Rigid Pavement Distresses. You're now ready to proceed to Module 9, Concrete Pavement Rehabilitation.